I now look to the first elected member of the Oxford Union Secretary Committee, Hadi Al Hibri, to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, and distinguished guests. And for those of you observing the holy month of Ramadan, I would like to wish you a Ramadan Mubarak. For those of you who don't know, I was asked to replace His Royal Highness Prince Hamza of Jordan speaking on the proposition tonight. While I'm not a Jordanian prince, unlike the other honorable speakers debating tonight here, I actually am an Arab from the Middle East. Further, but along the same lines, when we think of the Middle East, who do we think of? Arabs, Muslims, extremists? It's okay, we don't have to be politically correct. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in history, 65% of the Middle East is under the age of 30. These are young, young men and women who, like me, only want and relish, only want a better future and relish the opportunity to determine their own fortune. I believe it's crucial to give this majority a voice in this debate here in Oxford and in the real world. Mr. President, while I will be speaking in proposition of the motion put before the House tonight, I would like to be clear from the start that while I strongly agree with the rhetoric that the Western model of democracy is unsuitable for the Middle East, emphasis must be placed on the word Western. Allow me to clarify. I truly believe that all groups of people are capable of practicing democracy, and to think otherwise in 2018 is indicative of the very conundrum we are in. My argument tonight is that by confining our understanding of democracy to the specific Western model actively prevents us from understanding both democracy and its potential in the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring forth three main points in my speech tonight. First, that the term Western model democracy introduces a fundamentally flawed way of understanding democracy. Second, these flaws are part of a problematic worldview in which installing democracy has given, rise, uh, given cover to colonial and imperial projects in the region. Third, democracy can and has a, succeeded at times in the Middle East when it has been given the chance to develop. Let's discuss these points briefly one by one. Now, I assume that, uh, as Mr. Kirk highlighted, the opposition will continue to defend the notion that the Western model of democracy is the most suitable, or perhaps the only real model of democracy. Uh, yet the intellectual origins of democracy do not only come from the West, nor has the West been exclusively its greatest practitioner. Furthermore, classical democratic ideals from ancient Greek philosophers were themselves passed into European thought through Arab, Islamic, and other Middle Eastern philosophers and translators long before the notions of Europe or the West had even emerged. In the US, the authors of the American Constitution actively brought principles and mechanisms of governance from the Native Americans. For example, the idea of the Federation of States was barred directly from the great Sioux nation. Arguably, the truest fulfillment of Enlightenment notions of democracy occurred outside the West, in anti-colonial liberation struggles beginning in successful slave rebellions in Haiti against the French. Unfortunately, the contradiction of democracy at home and colonialism abroad is not a problem that the West has left in the 19th century. This brings me to my second point, but first I'd like to begin with a personal story. It's the 20th of March, 2003, I was nine years old and living in Bahrain at the time. I remember waking up at the crack of dawn, the sound of fighter jets flying over our house. These were US uh, warplanes returning to the US military base in Bahrain. Jumped out of bed, ran to the TV room, where I see my parents contemplating watching the news. On TV, I see flashing scenes of the aftermath of the notorious US shock and awe campaign in Iraq. What's happening, I asked. The U.S. started a war in Iraq, my father responded, turning back to the TV. My response was, why? What I didn't quite comprehend then, but is clear as day to me now, is the unfortunate recent history of democracy promotion by its so-called champions in the West. These shameful episodes authorized full-scale military invasions in Iraq and, under, and Afghanistan under the cover of installing democracy. Despite the American rhetoric of supporting democracy in the region, the truth of the matter is that the U.S. and its allies have often gone to great lengths to prevent authentic democracy in the Middle East. Western powers have supported and remained key allies uh, of authoritarian regimes who actively repress democratic aspirations. This strategy of only supporting democratic outcomes when it serves their interests dates back to the Cold War. Democracy is fundamentally about being responsive to the voting public and to represent the interests of the majority. However, in the Middle East, the overwhelming majority of the population regards the United States as the main threat to their interests. In well-documented reports by renowned organizations like the Brookings Institute, so it is estimated that some 80% of populations in these nations are strongly opposed to US policies and Western intervention. 
So behind the facade of Uncle Sam's democracy promoting, promoting propaganda, it is clear why the US and its allies would oppose the formation of democratic governments that are responsive to the will of their people. If allowed to develop, these parties that are most likely to win in these elections would be those strongly opposed to US and Western objectives in the region. Contrary to the Western, uh, contrary to belief of Western powers, we cannot impose democracy in nations in some sort of one-size-fits-all approach. If we actually want the Middle East to become more democratic, and we will become more democratic, the West has to accept these outcomes and allow democracy to proceed in its own course. And dare I say, treat the people of the Middle East as equals. Not by intervening and supporting compliant dictators, or by denouncing parties elected in democratic elections. Maybe for once in the Middle East, Western powers can work towards supporting the development of non-Western variations of democracy that can actually be implemented in the local context. This brings me to my third and final point. I'd like to address the fallacy that Arabs don't want democracy or that for some reason the religion of Islam is incompatible with democracy. I think it is now well established that the democratic uprisings that swept the Middle East during the Arab Spring attest to the fact that the large majority of people in the region do in fact want some form of democracy. Further, I am from Lebanon, where despite some flaws, we practice a confessional parliamentary democracy where elections were held just last month. Next, to attribute the lack of democracy in the Middle East to Islam is a grave misconception for a variety of reasons, and I wish to highlight a couple. When you look at Islam, like many other great religions, it is subject to interpretation. There exist open and flexible interpretations, and there are also extreme and conservative interpretations, as with all religions. However, if you look at the more liberal, inter liberal interpretations, you can find a lot of commonality with traditional democratic ideals, such as justice, personal religious freedom, and transparency. Further, Muslim-majority nations like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Bangladesh have had functioning democratic systems for several decades. More recently in Tunisia, the Nahda Party, which in the wake of the Arab Spring, rose to power in the first three democratic elections in the country's history, is by an, oh, its own charter defined as a liberal Muslim democratic party, or a democratic party with an Islamic reference. In fact, if you look at all literature produced by the Nahda Party since its founding in 1981, you will not find a single reference of Sharia law. Yet Tunisia is the only nation to successfully transition to some form of constitutional democratic governance following the Arab Spring. So why haven't other Arab states been able to follow a similar trajectory and adopt a more democratic form of governance, be it one with Islamic influence? Ladies and gentlemen, while there are undoubtedly many contributing factors, I believe the underlying problem to be twofold. On the one hand, it is the failure of the West to accept that the, rea the reality that these democratic systems may yield governments less compliant with the Western objectives in the region. And on the other hand, it is the failure of existing state systems to incorporate certain parties into the democratic process based on the fixation of following the Western model of democracy, which simply doesn't work. To conclude, while the term the Western model of democracy may be a problematic one, the idea that all people can govern themselves shouldn't be. If you believe that it is possible to move past these outdated perspectives, I urge you to vote in favor of the motion tonight. Not because the Middle East can't be Western, but because the Middle East can be democratic. Thank you.